Thank you. Um, so I would like to start with a quick introduction to secure two-party computation. So the idea is we have Alice and Bob, and they have some circuit C. They want to evaluate on inputs X and Y. And so the goal is for us to develop some protocol that lets Alice and Bob learn some value set. And the properties that we want is that the protocol is correct. So the value that Alice and Bob learn is actually the output of the circuit. Second, we also want uh, some kind of privacy so that the private inputs are uh, kept private even after the protocol is done. Um, when we talk of active security, we say that this should hold even if we have uh, an adversary that can corrupt one of these parties and deviate from the protocol in any arbitrary way. Uh, for this work in particular, we also care about a somewhat more vague property. We want the protocol to be practical, and what this means is basically we want it to run in some reasonable amount of time for reasonable sizes of circuits. So we want it to be practical enough to solve kind of real problems. So this leads us to the first motivation for this work. So we actually want to use this to solve some real problems. So one thing that we've been very interested in in Aarhus is computing the outcome of auctions. So I think we always have to mention this uh, thing here a few years ago when some people in Aarhus actually implemented a, a secure auction for some sugar beet farmers in, in, in Denmark. So there are real people who care about these things. Um, the kind of more specific motivation for this work was that when we at least started this, there was kind of a lack of diversity of practical uh, solutions to this problem. In fact, all the solutions that we saw were uh, based on Yao's garbled circuit technique. And not that there's anything wrong with this approach, but uh, you know, just for having a larger pool of ideas to draw on, it seemed interesting to see. Can we do something else? So what are the main building blocks of our approach? So instead of using Yao uh, circuits, we uh, uh, at kind of the base of our approach is another passively secure two-party computation protocol, namely the GMW protocol. Um, and then on top of that, we add some information, secure, information theoretic max to sort of ensure that active adversaries behave honestly. Now, this approach on its own would not necessarily be um, uh, practical uh, because the GMW protocol uses a lot of OT, and we know OT must be based on public key cryptography, which is uh, usually seen as something computationally expensive. Uh, so to get uh, efficiency, what we use is uh, these uh, OT extension techniques where we can take a small seed of um, uh, oblivious transfers that are, that are implemented with some public key cryptography or something like that, and then we can expand it or extend it to this huge amount of OTs that are amortized, uh, low amortized cost. And particularly for our uh, protocol, we're going to rely on the passively uh, secure protocol of each IADL, and then we're going to add some tricks to make it actively secure. So our results are that we get a new OT extension technique with active security. Now, this technique does not improve what we know we can do sort of asymptotically, but it uh, gives us a more practical protocol, um, which is only in fact a true slower than this uh, passive secure protocol of each Uh What this translates into is that we can implement this in Java and we can get something like half a million OTs per second per core. And using this, we get our practically uh, practical 2PC protocol, which is uh, UC secure against an active static adversary in the random Oracle model. Um, in terms of practicality, we get something like uh, 20,000 gates per second, or uh, if we just look at the online phase, we can actually do uh, more like a million gates per second. Okay, so what did this mean? Well, at least when we did imp this implementation, we had the fastest implementation of two PC uh, that we knew of. Unfortunately for us, within kind of the recent year, Kreuter, uh, Schlatt, and Shen, they presented a new uh, implementation based on garbled circuits, which does a little bit faster than we do. Um, uh, with, well, at least it seems to uh, show that our approach is somehow competitive. Um, 
with the garbled surface approaches. And anyway, it's kind of hard to compare because everything is implemented on different hardware and so on. So anyway, uh, let's start with a kind of high level overview of our protocol. So uh, as I said, we are based on the GMW protocol. And so let's see how this works. Alice and Bob, let's say, let's think of everything here as just being bits. So what Alice and Bob will start by doing is that they will create XOR sharings of the input bits. Then they will proceed in a gate by gate fashion. And um, if this, for instance, is an internal gate of the circuit, what Alice and Bob will do is that they will evaluate this, this gate in a way so that they learn an XOR sharing of the gate. And now if they do this for all gates in the circuit, uh, they will end up with an XOR sharing of the output gate. And uh, then it's very simple to learn the output. You just exchange shares and reconstruct. Okay. Now this is very good for the passive case, but there are some kind of obvious problems in the active secure case. Namely, uh, maybe the most obvious thing here would be that Bob could just send some different share of the output, and this would disrupt the correctness of the protocol. Um, so in order to deal with this, what we do is just add message authentication codes to all these XOR sharings throughout the whole uh, that you know, are in the whole protocol. And the idea is then we can use these, um, these uh, MACs to ensure that the opposing party will use the correct shares that they're supposed to. Okay, so at a very high level, this is kind of all, our, all the protocol does. Um, so like the two previous talks, we uh, live in this preprocessing uh, model. And what we do in our preprocessing model is essentially just we prepare a lot of authenticated uh, random messages, so bits with uh, max on them. Particularly, we need one for each input gate, and we're going to need 16b for each AND gate to get security 2 to the minus b times size uh, uh, log the size of the circuit. So this means that for very large circuits, this B parameter is going to be low, so we're going to, it's going to be something less than 10, but still, uh, for the whole circuit, we're going to need quite a lot of these uh, random authenticated messages. Um, the second part of the preprocessing phase, we prove some correlations between these authenticated messages. I'm not really going to get into this, but you can think of something like uh, 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 multiplication triples for for MCC, something like that. In the online phase, then we do something similar to uh, the other talks that have been here. Uh, we use these preprocessed values along with some very simple um, protocols in order to evaluate the circuit on the actual input. Okay, and the important thing here is that we don't really use any crypto primitives in the online phase. So the online phase is is super fast. So essentially, something like 10% of the time is going to be in the online. Even less, actually. Okay, so since this is in the preprocessing phase is where we do the most kind of heavy lifting, I'm going to uh, focus on this uh, for this talk. And I'm going to focus just on how we get these random authentications. Okay, so let's look at uh, these Macs that we use. So the setting is that we have uh, uh, Bob here will have some global key delta which is going to be a random string, the length of the security parameter. And then for every message that uh, Alice has, uh, x, Bob is going to have a local key, k, which is also just going to be a random string. And the Mac is then uh, k xor uh, x times delta. And to argue that these Macs are unforgeable, let's first see that the Mac does not actually give us any information on delta. Uh, but if we let M0 be a MAC corresponding to a zero message and M1 be a MAC corresponding to a one message, we see that if we know both these MACs, we can easily compute the global key. So somehow, intuitively, uh, forging a MAC uh, should be as hard as guessing this uh, global key. Okay. So how do we get such a MAC? So this is the functionality we want. It's pretty simple. We call it an A-bit because it authenticates bits. So we want something where Alice inputs uh, x, Bob inputs uh, a local key and a global key, and then 
we just get out these, uh, the, the Mac like I defined it before. And we want to implement uh, really a, a lot of these, these guys. Okay. Um, so these are two, the two steps of the protocol that implements this. So first we uh, obtain a few very, very long Macs for Alice's random bits, and then we're going to turn this into a lot of uh, short max on, on Bob's random bits, okay? And this is where we use this uh, OT extension uh, thing of Ishii et al. Uh, it's something very similar to their, their protocol. So to authenticate uh, these bits, we're going to use the OT functionality. So uh, what this does is that uh, Bob will have two messages, S0 and S1, that he implements to the functionality. Alice will input a choice bit C, and then out of the functionality will come the message that, that Alice chose, okay? And no one learns anything else. Now, for this particular application, we need the messages to be of length T, where T is some large value, essentially any polynomial in the security parameter. Um, so kind of the naive approach to doing this uh, authentication would be to just have Alice input the bit that she wants to authenticate, and Bob would input the two possible max, and um, the oblivious transfer would then output the max that, that we need. However, we need for Bob to use the same global key delta here for each one of these n uh, OTs. So we need some way to force him to do that because if he's actively corrupted, obviously he could choose a new global key every time. Okay, so this is our problem, and the solution is that we will actually just use this naive approach to authenticate twice as many um, bits as we need, and then we're going to use some cut and choose-like technique in order to force Bob to use consistent deltas. Um, now, unfortunately, this will sacrifice half of the authenticated messages that we get, but it's okay because the other half is going to be good. Now I call this a cut and choose like technique because um, uh, kind of the good news here is that while uh, sort of half of the messages will be uh, revealed during this cut and choose, the keys will still remain secret. So um, yeah, there are some, some details that I'm kind of hiding here, but you can look at the code for it. Okay, so now for step two, here I've written up these n max that we created in step one in this nice matrix form where you can see there are these long uh, column vectors. Uh, the first thing we'll do is just swap the position of the max and the keys, and we see this uh, equation still holds. The next thing to do is to kind of tilt our heads a little bit, and instead of looking at things as uh, columns, we'll look at them as short rows. I'm going to do some renaming. The first rows here I'll call N and L, and over here I'm going to take this vector of X's, X1 up to Xn, and just call that delta, and these, uh, or excuse me, gamma, or, and these delta bits, delta 1 to delta T, I'm going to call those Y. And what we see then is that this uh, equation here in the bottom is going to hold, um, which basically means that we can look at Ni as being a Mac on Yi, under the keys uh, Li and gamma. So now we have the, our short max for Bob. Okay. So just to give a quick summary of what happened here, we took a few OTs with long messages, so two N OTs with uh, messages of length T. Then we implemented N uh, long max for Alice, so max of length T, uh, N of those. And then those we turned into uh, many uh, short max for Bob, so T max of length N. And what you should notice here is that while these are short, they're still the length of the security parameter, so they should still be hard to guess. Um, but yeah, so this is what I told you here, but uh, what I would like to note here is that actually the initial OTs with long messages, these we can implement using OTs with short messages if we only have a pseudo-random generator. And at the other end of the uh, chain here, we can take these authenticated bits and then we can use those to implement uh, OTs with short messages. Uh, just using a hash function or something like this for every, uh, for every OT that we want. Um, 
So if we look at the whole chain, we get this, this OT extension technique that I told you about in the beginning. Okay, so yeah, finally, let's just conclude. I wanted to find some takeaway messages for you here. So the first one is, you know, finally, we have a non-garbled circuit approach to practical 2PC, so yay, that's fun. Uh, well, it's based on GMW and OT extension. It's maybe less exciting, but you should remember that as well. Um, it's really fast, so I mentioned that it, we were beat a little bit, but still, uh, you know, it's a very nice protocol. Uh, so if you're planning to implement some 2PC protocols anytime soon, I think you should try to, uh, to, to try this out. Okay, so this is all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you.